Up next, we have a panel on EVM, which is the Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, there's obviously some overlap here with the EWASM topic, including those of us on the stage. Um, unfortunately, we had a couple of other non-EWASM panelists who were not able to, to make it. Uh, but we do have Greg with us. Uh, I'm thrilled to have him join us for this part. Um, and just to be clear, this is, uh, the topic is, is EVM, as I said. Um, and we, we may touch upon some, some EWASM stuff, but we'll be focusing more upon the Ethereum virtual machine, what it looks like today, uh, the road forward, challenges, that kind of stuff. So cool, uh, I'll, I'll moderate, but why don't we kick off with introductions. Greg, do you wanna start? Yeah, I've, I put a lot of work into the, uh, what's now called Aleph, is it? Um, EVM uh, 1.0, and put a lot of work into uh, specification for making fairly quickly some improvements um, to get uh, better performance, better formal tractability um, for the EVM that could be get be got uh, that we can get into place much more quickly than the full EOS and development. Uh, those those got sort of set aside for the last year. I've I'm not I don't know why, but they did. Um, Greg, let's, that, that's a really interesting topic. We'll come back to that in just a we'll second. We'll come back to yeah, that. Yeah, we'll just do a quick intros and then we can so, start with that. <laughs> ah, we're, not, we're just doing an intro. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I did, and uh, I'm working on plans to, to get that going again quickly and well integrated with the EVMC work and the EWASM work um, so we can sort of front run on that and get people, uh, get people going and help we go. Thanks, Greg. Pavel? Uh, hi, I'm Pavel, and uh, I'm working for Ethereum for some time, and I was mostly interested in uh, EVM. Uh, long time ago, I even uh, created a project to uh, compile EVM code to, uh, to machine code, some kind of JIT solution, and that also inspired some uh, small but important changes in EVM spec uh, before uh, Ethereum even launched. And now I'm trying to bring some um, cooperation to, to EVM related software by uh, introducing this EVMC product to allow uh, quickly swap VM implementations. Uh, and I am also cooperating with EWASM team. I'm Casey. I uh, really got my start as a core developer on uh, Ethereum JS, the JavaScript uh, client, well, virtual machine. Um, back in 2017 for Byzantium, and uh, I also try to help with uh, security and testing, fuzz testing, uh, finding consensus bugs, and and I try to help out with, uh, contribute to um, research on, you know, Ethereum 2.0 uh, sharding. Um, my name is Alex. Um, I started off with Ethereum JS as well, working mostly on the VM in, in JavaScript, uh, but at the same time started to work on Solidity, uh, trying to fix bugs and then actually adding features. Um, so that resulted in a lot of EVM works, like both of these. Um, and ended up contributing to EVMC and ended up contributing to EWASM in the end. Uh, but I'm still uh, also very interested in improving the EVM. Uh, so actually with Pavel, we submitted a couple of EIPs and, uh, which are accepted to Constantinople and Pavel also submitted his own EIPs. And I was really excited of, of the EIPs uh, uh, Greg was doing regarding EVM 1.5. Um, but they are much bigger EIPs than what we have submitted. Um, um, so that's that's basically about me. Um, interesting in EVM as well, not just EWASM. Cool. I'm Lane. Um, I'm also on the EWASM team, been a member of that team since the beginning of this year. And I think my interest in things like instruction sets and EWASM and EVM comes from just a deep curiosity of starting at the very bottom of a system and kind of working my way up. There's a lot of amazing work being done at higher layers, layer two, layer three, et cetera, but really understanding um, this virtual machine, this Ethereum machine that we're building uh, from, from the bottom to start. Cool, so let me actually, I'll come back to EVM 1.5 stuff in just a sec, I promise. I just wanna kick off with uh, an introductory question, which is maybe Alex, you could take this one. Um, just what is EVM? How did this thing come into existence? What is it supposed to 
be or do. I, I may want to pass in there. If, <laughs> Someone if else want to talk to that? Um, I mean, it started from the beginning. There's a section of the yellow paper which describes the EVM. And uh, so it's, it's an essential part of even the concept of Ethereum. We have smart contracts and that what that's what initially distinguished Ethereum from others, and EVM is, is what did it. Um, and not to be too nasty, but a part of my job is to be a, a nasty old man and, and grouch, at, grouch at people, because I've been in the industry a long time, and the EVM we have was designed by cryptographers, not by virtual machine experts. So it has certain problems, which I ran into when I, when I went into it, when I got here and said, this, this thing needs to be a lot better. Some of the problems affect performance. Even worse, some of the problems make it very difficult to formally analyze the code. And that's something that's important to me. I sneered at formal, formal analysis my whole career because I didn't see that taking a 10,000 or 100,000 line program and then writing a, a million line proof was going to help anything. Now we're looking at um, programs which are even smaller than what we used to write for our Apple IIs, uh, smaller than the 64K segments on MS-DOS that we used to have to write in. I remember squeezing a relational database into a 64K segment. Um, <laughs> it suddenly starts to make sense uh, when you've got, you know, an awful lot of money hanging on 24K of code to spend a lot of money doing anything you can to prove it right. And the current VM makes that very difficult. WASM makes it a lot easier. But when I arrived, WASM was not yet a thing. There was, uh, it was a dream. I don't know exactly where it was in the roadmap, but it, it, it was not, there was no spec for it. It was finished. It was uh, not uh, minimal, minimal viable, viable product was not even there. So I, I set out to say, well, I don't want to wait that long. And I'm getting back to doing that, but that's basically what the EVM is right now and part of the troubles we're running into it. And what I joke, uh, here's the T-shirt the from uh, uh, Cancun, day of, day of the Dead. It's a day after Halloween now. There was an accident with laundry bleach, so it's been to hell and back. Uh, <laughs> And I never again want to be awakened on a Caribbean beach during a vacation uh, to discover that, you know, yet another million ETH has fallen down a rat hole because there was a one-line bug in a program. And uh, so that's my goal right now. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, so I'm just trying to get together some people and some money uh, to pursue that in parallel and trying to get in coordination with the WASM team so we can get that done more quickly onto the main chain. Um, and we're going to be able to compile that code to WASM code so there's not going to be any real conflict or trouble uh, for customers as we, as we move into WASM. I sort of see WASM as becoming the, uh, the assembly language of Ethereum. Uh, I think just half a your um, interesting line. I kind of felt like that you're saying that Wasm is ready now. We don't need EVM. But then you iterated on it, and I think it was really interesting what you said in, in general. Um, I want to hear a bit more about that at some point. Let me just add a tiny bit more color to the introducing EVM idea um, as. You said, Greg, right, EVM is sort of the, the implementation of the yellow paper, right? It's the state transition uh, machine in the yellow paper. Um, and it's a really interesting, unique, really well-designed virtual machine. Um, and I'm, I'm going <laughs> to... 
I, hold on, hold on. Wait till I share the second half of my thought. So, <laughs> it's, so I'm, I'm, paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing Nick Johnson here. Uh, it's well designed. However, it's a theoretical sort of virtual machine, right? So you get these interesting things like these 256-bit words. So even if you want to do very simple integer math, uh, you know, you're, you're, it, it's very inefficient, right? Because you have all these kind of wasted bits. Um, and it, it doesn't resemble anything like an actual um, hardware instruction set, whereas in contrast to something like WebAssembly, WebAssembly is very close to actual hardware. Does that sort of address your concern, Boris, or do you still think it's, okay, cool. I believe what I have heard said from other people who are experts in the space is that it is an excellent VM using theories from the space. Exactly, okay. Okay, so just to restate what, what Boris said for, I guess, recording and, and internet peoples, uh, the uh, EVM is a very well-designed VM using technology that sort of comes from the 1960s and that we could develop a much better VM today using modern technology. It also has a, a very clever feature uh, called the dynamic jump, which back in, uh, I think, actually, 50s, Fortran had. It was called a computed go-to in which you can do some sort of arithmetic that says where you want to jump, and then you jump. Why is that a bad thing? Because when you're doing formal analysis, you get to that point in the code, and you want to say, well, where does this jump go? And the answer is, it can go anywhere in the program. And when I, <laughs> I, I you know, I'd done one round of optimization. I think I about doubled the speed of the interpreter. And then I wanted to do the next round to apply some techniques that I'd invented um, in optimizing the interpreter in uh, the Oracle kernel. And uh, came around and went, uh-oh. And I showed it to Christian. And he said, well, of course, because of the dynamic jump, you don't know what level of the stack you're at. And I'm going. Shoot, <laughs> um, and stronger words than that, and that's, then I started going, okay, how do I fix this, and discovered it's like, there's no basic subroutine, uh, you know, just a sub-instruction, and even in the 60s, and even in the 50s, most computer architectures had some sort of instruction for, for making subroutines, and um, the idea was, well, you can make those out of dynamic jumps. And if you ever look at the code that Solidity generates for calling a function, it's, um, it's, it's pretty ugly. <laughs> so my um, next... Uh, sorry, I got a follow-up question. Pavel, um, you said earlier that you suggested some small but important changes to the EVM <coughs> uh, before you know, Genesis launched back in 2015. Um, was the dynamic jump on your radar? At that yeah, time? that was the problem. So even before it was, the situation was much worse because now at least you have uh, specify what are possible destinations for jump. So you have special jump desk instruction. So these are valid places where you can jump to. Before that, there was no, no such thing, so you can jump anywhere, including data from push, even. So you can execute code in push data. And like, so before it was impossible to have any other translation, uh, further translation of EVM bytecode. So that at least like allows some some way of compiling EVM bytecode to machine code because on this machine code level you are not allowed to do. I mean, there's a way, but that would be horrible. So yeah, that that was that was the change and so the jump so destinations. You mean. I kind of like I joined quite late during the process and also I didn't know much as I know now and like didn't have courage to to change it to something like better behaving. Although we had like a uh, JVM example when there is like it's fixed uh, it's fixed uh, how like what what the stack height can be on, on when you enter the function what can, yeah so kind of like yeah this is this is missing uh, definitely 
we're getting deeply technical here. I don't know. <laughs> some people are probably excited, and some people are just. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have at least one nerd in the room. Uh, yeah, um, we'll we'll save tons of time for audience yeah. questions. Another problem is that you can. You can optimize this. The compiler can look and go, well, yes, you're using 256-bit registers, but there's instructions like add mod and mul mod, so you can say that really I'm operating at 200. I'm only using 64 of these bits. The compiler can generate 64-bit code, but tough. We're still going to charge you gas as if you were working with 256 bits. I think only in the last month, I think I figured out a way to fix that, looking at the work um, that's being done on the IELE virtual machine uh, that Rigor and other people at runtime verification have been working on, but I haven't had time to talk to anyone and write, a, write an EIP on that, but basically to charge the gas based on how wide you actually know. Um, um, what you can tell is the maximum width of register you need. So there's basically things that can be fixed, and we think um, uh, Boris, who just spoke up there, and I don't know if Brooke is still around or not. She's, she's an amazing formalist. Um, she's going to be humble there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Greg, before, um, before you go any further, I um, just wanted to reflect on one part. Mm -hmm. um, you said that maybe specify the actual width of the data you want to uh, apply the uh, mm -hmm. computation on. Um, there's just one thing to, to worth mentioning here. Um, currently, the instruction set looks like as uh, there's a single instruction which can have an immediate value, and that is the push instruction. Mm -hmm. No other instruction can have, can have immediate values. Mm -hmm. uh, every single other instruction is just operating on the stack. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of different proposals to augment other instructions to have immediate values uh, or have like multi-byte codes, opcodes to encode you know, different behaviors. Um, and there was a big resistance to do that. Um, and one of the, the reasons people said that it's going to make uh, the current verification tools have to be changed and we cannot afford that. So there was a, a real big pushback. And what you suggest, I think, uh, how would you imagine it to be implemented if, uh, say, like the additional addition opcode would have an immediate value specifying the, the bit it's operating on, or you would have a multiple bytecode uh, opcode. Um, mm -hmm. But we have this pushback that people don't want to have changes there. You can simply you can simply call mod after you pulled that data in because you know you only need so many bits. And on a and you want to detect patterns in in the VM that there's like a mod before, and then there's a calculation, and you charge less. Yeah, if you, if, if some data came in, and then you mod, you've just thrown away all those bits, and it means a compiler like Solidity will have to generate code to take advantage of that. And uh, Solidity is actually today generating code like that if you're using smaller data types. Mm -hmm. But since gas is charged for even the mod instruction, it is more expensive, right. so people don't use it. Right. So we have to change the gas model so that that actually helps in the way it was intended to help. So we talked about one thing that we kind of have consensus that we could or should and maybe will change, which is removing dynamic jumps. Uh, I'm curious what other things, if you could change one thing Besides that, in EVM, what would you change? Maybe we could just, I don't know if you guys all have an answer. Um, I guess we have overlapping answers. Um, the big one is to remove dynamic jumps, have call frames, um, and this will give a couple of different benefits. A lot of those Greg explained, uh, but another immediate benefit people are actually going to feel is you can address uh, more of the, you can address like the, the arguments to the function much more easily than, than right now, and it also makes uh, compiler code generation phase easier. Uh, people have a lot of pain with solidity, giving this random, awkward error message, stack too deep. And it is giving it in various different ways, where various different locations. And this, it's, it's just a lot of work to, to work around that with the current EVM model. Um, so I think this is the core, which, which is blocking so many things. Um, so that would be my number one. Casey, do you have one? Um, no, I'd rather just switch to uh... Web assembly. <laughs> Pavel. Uh, for me, it would be uh, all of this 
let's say, soft errors that you can get. I mean, when you divide by zero, you get zero. It doesn't make sense. When you access data that doesn't, isn't there, you get zero. And like all of this, for, for first, it makes uh, verification harder, not, not easier. Although, like some people said, like, now it's defined what's going to happen, but it mathematically doesn't make sense. And it's also like very dangerous, and we have examples of this uh, being broken in in deployed production ready uh, smart contracts. So yeah, that that would be my change. So I would just uh, terminate execution if something like that happened. Mm -hmm. Greg, up to you, and, and feel free to use this well, as an opportunity to introduce your ideas yeah, for 1.5. Um, and I'm with Casey, and this part of why I asked the question on scheduling, because um, I know that I can much more rapidly implement EIP 615. And Which one is 615? That's, that's, the, that's the proposal to get rid of dynamic jump, right. introduce subroutines and a few other opcodes. Um, to, to clean that up, it would be a separate, there's separate things you could do, like what Pavel mentioned, um, those might be work you don't want to do. There's a EIP 616 to put in SIMD, it's not clear if we want to do that or just wait for WASM. But, um, so for me, work, I'm working with Boris and, and Brooke to just uh, raise the money and put the plan together to do that. Just because for personal reasons, I decided I didn't didn't want to do it under contract with the foundation directly, um, but wanted to have more more control over the project myself. Um, and this is this is EVM 1.5. What you're referring to? Yeah. The collection of these two. Yeah, yeah. These. and I guess Boris is telling me getting out, talking to some fair number of other clients. You're going if we can quickly get this stuff, we'd really like it. Um, and EVMC means if we wrap it up that way, um, they can get it, they can plug it in, they can use it, and then when WASM is available, they can get it, they can plug it in, they can use it, um, and uh, just try and try and get past this problem you know, much more quickly. Um, so there's kind of two schools of thought right now about the state execution engine in Ethereum. One is we should focus all of our resources on UWASM and sort of as Casey alluded to before, like that should be the emphasis right now. But there's clearly another side, another way of looking at this, which is that we should not, we should not, we should not try to deprecate EVM and we should accept that it's going to be with us for a while and we should be investing more in it. I'm just wondering, Greg, maybe you want to make the case for why that's worth doing, even in light of UWASM. Um, I haven't counted, but how many EVM contracts are on the blockchain now? What rate is it growing at? Um, is it quadratic or exponential? Um, if it's exponential, however long it takes to get EWASM out, how many more EVM will be out there? How many existing tools exist for analyzing EVM one code? How many uh, new languages are being created? You know, basically, there's already an ecosystem growing up around that. Um, and so it doesn't help the community to just say, well, don't bother because at some point in the future, we're going to throw that away. The Sinclair, the Sinclair issue. If we start announcing EWASM and everybody stops building smart contracts for a year, that's a problem. The Sinclair issue. Uh, like both EWASM and EVM 1.5, um, I'm curious what are the backwards compatibility concerns with, say, removing dynamic jumps? Uh, I know I know with EWASM, there, there's various proposals to add backwards compatibility, which might help alleviate um, the Sinclair issue that I, I'm, Boris. I believe Boris, Boris mentioned. Uh, so I'm curious um, if you, you guys could maybe fill me in on that, and then we can... Well, for, for EVM 1.5, uh, there was a simple idea to do some pre-processing on the deployment time, so we don't allow dynamic jumps anymore. I mean, we don't allow to deploy, let's say, EVM 1.0 contract at some point, but the ones that are there, they will be there all the, uh, all the time. Um, I have an addition to this. Um, so we have these uh, two translation tools. 
Uh, originally named EVM2 Wasm, but now we have a, a new version called YEVM, uh, which compiles EVM bytecode to Wasm bytecode. Now, it is not really optimal because of the very same reason, uh, but would, uh, would EVM 1.5 be implemented, then we would have a much more um, optimized compiler. Um, so I think there's like an overlap between these things. Uh, I'm not fully, personally not fully uh, sold on the 616 EIP, which is the mm, SIMD. I'm not either. Uh, but 615, I think it's a low-hanging fruit. And if you combine it together with uh, what Pavel said, that, okay, we disable uh, the 1.0 deployment, and it's only just this uh, 1.5, which is the 615. It's so many numbers. Anyway, it's, it's yeah. just about the uh, uh, di removing dynamic jumps, jumps. So if we enable that forcefully and, and disable deploying old contracts, um, the Solid compiler already supports it. Uh, I think there was an implementation you made in Aleph. Uh, it's likely it's a low-hanging fruit, uh, which I think could be, I mean, I would be really optimistic uh, to even have it after Constantinople, but just right people have to be convinced. Uh, but it definitely, this single step does help the transition to, to eWASM as well, if you want to keep backwards compatibility between the mm -hmm. two. Yeah, the code, the code is in, is in there. I think last time I looked, you, you'd moved it to the side, but it's still there. I think it's not there anymore. <laughs> Over, didn't you have your uh, legacy? Um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's, it's JIT. It's somewhere down yeah, in it's there. Somewhere. Um, it can be pulled back out. It was implemented. Some testing needs to be done. Yeah, um, but it doesn't. Yeah, I can work alone for six months and, and have something. Um, yeah, we we'll need need some more help on some other stuff. But um, it's just not that hard to get that going. Um, and depending on scheduling, I think it can be done more qu more quickly uh, than EWASM can be can be delivered. You know. <laughs> so, it's related but slightly higher level question: Why do you guys think EVM has been so slow to evolve? Is it technical? Is it political? Is it something else? Because no resources were put into it. I think one of the issues that we have is we look at uh, a couple of things. Uh, I see a split, split between uh, researchers, implementers, and people who are attempting to ship bug-free production code on top of the world computer, all of which that are happening at the same time. Um, and uh, again, always a hard call to say when you should ditch old and go to new and everything else like that. But if the people who do research never have to do production implementation, it's the same issue between DevOps and developers. If you never actually have to maintain stuff in production, uh, a research engine needs to be built differently rather than optimizing for people who actually have to ship code in production. And it feels like there was a large movement for whatever reason to new, new, uh, and we should not be afraid to keep fixing old stuff. Maybe there was another perception that fixing a VM was hard, but if you just bring in people with VM expertise, it's not that hard. My opinion. We have a late addition to the panel. Everett, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> I'm Everett Hildenbrand. I've been working on uh, formalization of VMs and stuff like that. I had some meetings before this, but uh, one thing I've worked on formalizing is the WASM VM, um, but not as much recently because I've been busy with things. But. Hang on to that microphone. But, so, but don't be shy. You also did KEVM. Oh, yeah, that's true. So, so one thing, one topic, can, can you speak about IELE a tiny little bit? You feel confident to do that? One, one thing that came up was this other virtual machine. Would you mind taking 60 seconds to tell us what that is and how it's similar or different to EVM and WASM? Um, so IELE is a VM that we designed for, uh, we being runtime verification, designed for the Cardano network. Um, and it has a lot of similarities to LLVM. Uh, we had some LLVM experts kind of on our team who helped us design it. And we mostly tried to avoid building in anything that would make verification difficult uh, to the VM. So things like mStore8 or <clears throat> other uh, issues with the EVM we kind of tried to avoid. It's a registered based uh, machine, so 
People have different opinions on that. Um, I don't really care either way. And it supports out of the box unbounded integer arithmetic. Um, so you can just use a proper int type in the VM, but then we have kind of a more complicated gas model to account for that. So. Cool. Um, just want to reiterate the question because you were late. Um, the, the question was why didn't EVM improve over time? Um, and Boris explained a couple of reasons. Uh, I wanted to add a single reason, um, which also Greg mentioned that lack of resources. Uh, that a lot of resources were, were um, shifted to eWASM, and there weren't many resources left on EVM. And then at the same time, the, uh, the research team also shifted their focus, and they weren't really interested in, in getting anything done in EVM. Uh, so there was nobody to propose except Greg to propose ideas, and then there was nobody to execute those ideas. It's really hard to work alone uh, on improving uh, the EVM. So there's been some conversations even here at DevCon the past couple of days that maybe while we wait for uh, Shasper, sorry Vitalik, Serenity to like become a thing and be alive, that there, there is value in reinvesting in Ethereum 1.0 or 1.5 or Ethereum next generation or whatever you want to call it. Is this, could this be part of that conversation, improving EVM? And if so, like, what would that look like maybe? I, mean, I can add one, um, one side to that. Um, I think the, say, Ethereum 1.5 Berlin plan, Ethereum no regrets, Ethereum NG, all these different names refer to the same thing. Um, and that was, that was not really about the VM, but other parts of the, the network, um, which may just make sense to do them separately because they're not that interconnected, at least at this level, of, uh, at this stage of where the discussions are. Um, it wasn't the, the VM execution time which was the bound or the reason we need to make those changes. So I think we can keep them separate, and that's what Greg kicked off with his EVM 1.5 proposal. Um, and if, if you keep them separate, you can also do them in parallel and maybe get them in more quickly. Um, but that's just my addition to it. Maybe, Casey, you want to put your... I have a comment, actually, about why it's difficult to update the the EVM, and I think it's actually just because it's, well, you start with something that's EVM, which is kind of designed, you know, ad hoc-ish. It's, it's, it wasn't like someone, they took some existing VM and then made it blockchain capable. They, you know, it was just designed from the start. And then as the hard fork started piling on, the logic behind various different parts of the VM got more complicated. So the recent Constantinople hard fork, um, the rules for storage allocation just I mean, it like literally tripled, tripled in length how many different cases we have to handle, and it's like different depending on which fork you're on, and it's, it's a major pain. So I think part of the problem with evolving the EVM is kind of maintaining backwards compatibility. So having the ability to support the new EVM execution model and the old EVM execution model is just going to complicate the clients to the point where working on them to update them for future hard forks is going to get more difficult over time. So I think that can be a major barrier as well. Um, basically the, the backwards compatibility issue. Can that be avoided at all? I mean, you moved eWASM, but we still got all these weird, all this weird stuff. It gets moved up to your environment interface, and even with the current, even with the old VM, I would love to take a whole lot of those opcodes, which really aren't, they really have nothing to do with the virtual machine um, that I could easily as the evolution goes, say, okay, let's pull all of that out of the VM, deprecate it, and move it up to the environment interface. Um, because we can't, the functionality's there, we, we've got we've to deal with it. Um, one note on, on the backwards compatibility and, and EVM itself. Um, that promise actually was broken, I, I believe, with Spurious Dragon or Tangent Invis or whatever the code name was, um, back like two years ago, where cost gas costs were in, uh, increased. And before that, I think it was never explicitly said that gas cost cannot be increased, but a lot of contracts assume that. And once you increase the gas cost, so one example, when a contract makes a call to another contract, previously they made like a fixed calculation in the contract in many cases. And once you bumped up the cost, in some cases, they, they just failed. I tried and they were done. Um, so we broke that backwards compatibility uh, promise at that point. Uh, but all the proposals since then just reduced the costs. 
So like this S store change you mentioned that reduced the cost. Um, but I think because we broke that promise and a lot of the, okay, the two languages don't, uh, they take that into consideration, I think it would be possible to, to do like a cleanup of the gas, gas rules. Um, in, in some cases, may, that may result in increased cost for a given contract or a decreased cost, mm -hmm. um, but it shouldn't break contracts entirely. But it is a, a, say, a political question at that point if, if a contract is increased so much in cost um, that it kind of breaks the, the user experience and, and you know, it's an important contract. Uh, even if we just ignore the complexity of the gas model, which is arguably where a lot of the complexity in, in this happens, there's still complexity if we want to, say, deprecate old opcodes or something like that. And at that point, what do you tell the owners of contracts who, you know, use those opcodes? If you want to deprecate it and say, you know, we want to remove this so that we can start to evolve it to something that's a little saner or, or a little more modular or, or is more compatible with other VMs, who knows? But it there's just... There's not something built into to the system that says, you know, we're going to at some point be able to say, no, your contract is no longer going to be able to execute on the. That wasn't what people signed up for when they signed up for Ethereum initially. Mm -hmm. There's uh, there's a joke uh, that goes Intel. We put the backwards and backwards compatibility, <laughs> <laughs> and we're stuck with that. Any contract that works that got put on the chain has to keep working forever unless, unless well it has to keep working forever it has it has an address it can be called um, okay can I just mention a strange example to this um, the call code of code uh, which which was quickly fixed by introducing a new upcode called delegate call just right two months after launching ethereum because call code was supposed to do what delegate call is doing but it wasn't Yet we still kept it, and nothing is using it um, because it's useless. Yet we still have it. Uh, how can yeah. we remove it? The best we can do, both both, the best we can do for any VM is when you deprecate it is you keep you have to keep supporting it in old code. But if they try and put a new contract on the blockchain that uses a, that uses a deprecated feature, they can't put it on the blockchain anymore. So. <laughs> Yeah, deprecating stuff is definitely hard, but about Everett's comment that um, adding new features or new opcodes or changing the way existing opcodes work increases the complexity of the code base because if the code has to support the you know the old fork rules and then you know the next fork rules and the next one, then you get all these conditionals. Uh, all that is, you can actually uh, get rid of that by just only supporting the new fork rules and uh, resetting, you know, essentially like resetting the uh, Genesis block at a more recent snapshot. Um, I'm not sure why so many clients and, uh, you know, users are obsessed with being able to process all the way from the um, Genesis block and then <laughs> through all the fork rules and then currently, but... Uh, what do you do about a what about a contract that has some logic about how their funds are supposed to be paid out? You reset your Genesis block, you essentially forget their code structure or something like that, and then what happens to those no, funds? No, that I mean, are... no, I'm saying the, the, you know, you start at the snapshot of a current, of a state after the fork, right? Then that client sinks starting from that snapshot and it only has to support the new fork rules. At that point, you call into a contract that was created before that on a previous fork, right? Its logic is broken on the new fork, potentially. Well, so maybe you've locked up someone's funds or... Uh, yeah, that's why I said you can't... It, you really can't deprecate stuff or it's really hard to. You can only, mm -hmm. you know, change things. Um, Again, the, the, uh, the Intel chip started out as a hand calculator and that code still runs, it doesn't run very well. It, it, those opcodes have actually become pretty slow, and there's a good reason not to use them anymore. But that hand calculator is still in there. And to some extent, you know, we sit here bitching about it. 
and it's just tough shit. Suck it up. <laughs> I want to save some time for audience questions. Let's be, maybe 10 minutes left for that. Let's go ahead and do that. Anyone have a question or comment, complaint? Any of the above? <laughs> Boris, always. Boris. <laughs> So one of the things I want us to think about is um, I'm starting to think about the different components of what is Ethereum, um, just as we're maybe thinking about what is Web3 and how much we're integrating and EAPs and other stuff like that with IPFS and so on. Um, the EVM goes beyond Ethereum public mainnet. So today, Microsoft released a new EVM. The E-EVM, uh, written in C, uh, without gas calculations, <laughs> Um, that is designed for private networks. So how much from the perspective of an EVM specification do we broaden uh, to support and work with other chains? Like the way I see it, we might have a very large EVM community uh, that might want to work together and fix some of the resources issue. So just some, some thoughts that I'd love to hear the panel's ideas on. I'd actually like like to ask you a question because you, because <laughs> nobody else, nobody wants to ask for Boris's question. <laughs> Sorry, Boris. It's too hard. Yeah. Well, I, I, can, you, can you clarify? Uh, one, one second. Can you clarify? Are you asking specifically about? Are we going to support the other? E, e, or? I I don't know. <laughs> um. I, I mean, we can certainly build formal models of those other ones, and then we can look at them and see, okay, can we apply those changes that they make to, to our EVM as well, but... Yeah. Okay, so, so maybe this is not relevant, and in fact, various things called EVM are going to live in their own worlds. It just feels like it might be a way to actually broaden our community uh, and get high-quality code together. So, so just so, an idea. So from my perspective, that's one of the main goals of eWASM is that we're stepping into a much broader community. So the other EVMs should all die? No, I didn't, I didn't say that, but I'm saying if that's our goal, I think that eWASM largely serves that goal. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. so in EVM, uh, well, over the years, there have been a couple of other chains using it, and most of those chains have made additions to it um, in, in forms of new opcodes to access data. So one example, I think, is Rootstock. They had like six opcodes. Um, there were a couple of others I cannot recall right now, um, but all of these, maybe for the lack of the platform to communicate these ideas, they are forks, they're not compatible. Um, and when they made these changes, they also had to change the languages supporting EVM, which at the time was really just Solidity. So they forked Solidity to, to support those things. Um, and I don't really see any communication between any of these other forks or users of EVM at the moment. Um, I think we have to overcome that issue first, get like a discussion flowing between the different EVM forks, um, between like, you know, the mainnet in form of EIPs, and as well as like the, the language designers, compiler, authors in the Ethereum space. Um, and once that is solved, you can, you can then consider how to, you know, make bigger changes and get those changes down to them. Uh, but we, we have those channels closed for some reason. So yeah, so for me it's it's yeah from my perspective it's mostly communication issue. I mean it's so easy to fork and then never go back for the upstream project, whatever direction the communication should go. So like everyone is having like own EIP repo with EIPs like with different names. Even Coven Network has what I find out like last week. There's like Coven Network uh, improvement proposal something and. Uh, so this information is not exchanged. So this is, I don't know how to fix it. Maybe you have some ideas, but yeah, definitely to having some, um, some platform to communicate that uh, would, be, would be great. Mm -hmm. I personally hope like we can get EVMC in, in Sputnik VM, which is by Ethereum Classic. Uh, I haven't checked the details, what, what changes do they have, do they support all of that, but seems quite close to our needs. So that would be interesting to, to try it on, on Ethereum network. Any other questions? Yep, we have another one, Jared. Uh, 
Um, so since you're um, I wanted to <laughs> clarify that Microsoft um, EVM implementation is for uh, SGX environment. So basically, the gas calculation doesn't make sense there. Uh, basically, they want to you know enable it on Azure, uh, and you can just you know send code and get the uh, get the verified computation off chain, which is pretty interesting. But I guess the gas calculation doesn't make sense there. Thank so you for the Sorry, Craig, did you have a follow-up question here? Um, you did the KVM work. Um, I've had some conversations and work with uh, Seed, whoever he is. <laughs> uh, there's a man whose jitter tag is Seed. I don't know who he actually is, but we've had a lot of <laughs> a lot of communication. Uh, and he's working on a, a LAM formalization uh, forked off of uh, UHE's uh, formalization. Um, and we've talked a bit about where the, the current the current EVM gets in the way of that kind of thing and how uh, my proposals are intended to help. Um, Seed is, was quite excited, contacted me. It's like, when did these go in? They would help so much. Uh, but I'm wondering, as a formalist, what your opinion is of how much would it help and how bad is it right now? Well, nothing's crashing and burning, so I think it's not it's not too bad. But it, yeah, it's it's quite a pain to update KVM, especially anything regarding the the gas calculations, because there's I mean you have to do things in a very specific order, and it's it's kind of annoying that you have to do that. Um, I, I don't know, like for for reference, maybe I can say how long it took to formalize EVM versus how long it took to formalize the fragment of WASM, which is most of the execution, but just not the modules. Um, and EVM took, I want to say, I mean, depending on how you count between, you know, eight and 14 months and, and WASM was closer to the six month mark, maybe. So I think that just that alone, and the WASM definition is just shorter, and it's cleaner, and it just makes more sense, and it 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 just feels more coherent. Um, mm -hmm. um, and it all kind of presents itself nicely together instead of uh, well, feeling just, scatterbrained. Just, I, don't, I don't know. Proposal to, to ban mm -hmm. dynamic jumps. Oh, to ban dynamic jump. Oh, that one specifically? How much does that proposal help? Oh, my gosh, that would help so much. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. That, that, that is a single, like, when we made a, our own, like, EVM 1.5, I called it EVM Prime as a kind of just a toy, like, how would I change the EVM type of thing? And that was the very first thing I did was, was just, okay, all jumps are actually labeled, and you only can jump to the jump labels or something like that. And then... On top of that, we put structured control flow like if and while and stuff like that. And, and it makes static analysis tools way more effective, like, like worlds and worlds more effective. And then it makes uh, verification efforts a lot easier as well. So Can dynamic we jumps are, are terrible. Can we hire you? For, for what? <laughs> we can do uh, one, one, one last question. Do we have one last <clears throat> more audience questions? Can I have a question to Greg? Oh, sure. All right, never mind. Sorry, audience. Uh, I'm going to be quick. Uh, Greg, you, you mentioned that at some point that uh, EVM might be the, the general description of, of the contract itself, but it's not the way it is executed. It's just translated to something else. Maybe I got it wrong, but that's what you mentioned like in the first five minutes that maybe you would translate it to, to WASM at some point instead. Well, I'm saying we can do the work now to get a better EVM ready and going on the main chain because sharding, all of that's also somewhere way out in the future. We don't know where it is. Um, and then when WASM is on the main chain, solid, formalized, ready to go, and your compiler to compile from EVM to WASM is ready to go, there's not any big problem to migrate code. You, there is no migration, it just, that's just the way that it gets executed, right? No one. No one cares whether you compile it to WASM and then, then compile the WASM to machine code. 
or interpret it or compile it right to machine code that the user doesn't care about that as long as it gets executed correctly. But short term, we, we want to just get it working and a little bit longer term, um, <coughs> whoa, excuse me. Uh, um, just a little longer term, we, you know, we now have a, 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 a formally verified subset of C. Uh, we've got, I don't know, is it a subset or all, but LLVM has been formally verified. Um, so we can have a, form of ver a formally verified EVM 1.5 execution kind of specifications. Mm -hmm. We can have specifications, but I wouldn't say it's verified. It's just a specification. Okay. So as usual, Grigor is uh, <laughs> promising a little bit more than exists. But uh, I, I want to put in another just question, and we shouldn't answer it right now. Just leave it hanging. Um, if we just culminating all these discussions we had, if we keep adding these changes to EVM, yet we have to keep backwards compatibility, you know, to a certain extent, or the different ways to do it, and then we still plan to switch to EWASM, does that leave us with more legacy we have to keep because all of this stuff is on the mainnet, mm -hmm. or you know, is oh, it a better oh. position? But I don't think we should answer this right now. We should just yeah. think about this a bit more. <laughs> and uh, yeah. or we, did we have time for one more question yeah. from the audience? Okay, a two-second answer is just. As WASM gets more stable, you stop, you cap off EVM1 and say it's... It's, it's still on the main chain, you have to support it. It has to be supported forever. I'm saying it can be supported with the compiler and you stop evolving it so you don't keep creating backwards compatibility. Cap. So we have a next panel at some point. Yeah, yeah. all right, we're gonna, we're gonna stop there. Thank you guys very much, thanks for listening.